Hey, okay, welcome back. Um, so Jan Schaefer is actually going to introduce this panel. I have no business being out there, but I grab the microphone because I'm going to say something. The four women on this stage, you may not know all of them, or all of you may not know them, um, but behind the scenes have been some of the biggest supporters of what Lion does and local online news and the help of local ecosystem. Um, Jan Schaefer has been an advisor to Lion from when it was not, you know, it was just a gleam in someone's eye, right? Um, and it has helped steer us through uh, uh, advice on, on the funding and so forth uh, to support what you guys do. Um, Molly D. Aguirre, um, formerly of the Geraldine Ardage Foundation, now the News and Technology Initiative, um, similarly has not really been on the phone constantly with us to give us advice, but has behind, you know, a lot of people ask the question, are you here in the hallways at an event like this? Um, and over the course of the year, our Facebook group, like, what are the foundations doing to support, like, small publishers or, uh, or for-profit publishers? I um, mean, you saw the Democracy Fund grant is an example of what they are doing. Um, but there's people like Molly who have been advocating for that kind of relentlessly for years um, in the world of foundations and stuff like that. Um, and then Karen Rutlett um, has been our uh, Sherpa for the Knight Foundation, um, guiding us through um, not only before we got our grant, but since then. And, so, and, and it wasn't just about money, but all of the doors that they've opened for us with other people and um, uh, not only funders and, and, and people on Facebook and stuff like that that we want to partner with, but um, in um, in finding uh, people with the ideas that lead line and, and connect us to them. And then finally, uh, Teresa Gordon from the Democracy Fund. Uh, very similarly, the Democracy Fund from the beginning of the Democracy Fund has been talking about local news um, and independent news. Um, and has um, and before we start talking about the grant, was supporting line in many of the same ways that I just discussed. Um, and has been wonderful about guiding us through this process. Just had to say that, Jim. <laughs> I agree. Um, follow it up. Okay, uh, I know we don't have a lot of time before lunch, so um, I talk fast anyway, and so uh, we'll move fast. Um, and, oh, why am I moderating this panel? I used to give money away for startups in days when we actually gave money away for startups. Um, but as you all know, anybody that's raised money for a while, um, the pendulum swings, and I have seen it swing from journalism as a um, form of democracy building to uh, funding startups to networking and collaboration, which is not funding data, to tech tools, to sustainability and other work for revenues, to investigations, to impact and engagement, and then it's now it's trust and capacity building. And I will not say that with um, Digital First and uh, Gatehouse now being run by hedge funds and Gannett contracting, um, that there was renewed um, interest from a lot of funders in funding the, they were intervening in some way in the local, building the local news ecosystem. So I am personally delighted that a lot of our current funders are women, and I'm sorry if I, I don't mean to offend any guys in the room, but my experience is that when guys were the program directors, they, their passions were around tech tools and toys, and I think that women as program directors actually pay a little more attention to journalism um, and to community building. So. <laughs> Um, so, um, with that, I would like to ask um, a, the, each of our panelists to a big overview question, uh, to start with a, a bit of bio about themselves, um, and then uh, to tell us what your priorities are in funding and where those may intersect um, with the interests of Lion members. Teresa, I mean, you just gave a big grant, but you want to start? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, and I do want to shout out to some of my male colleagues um, that, that are pretty great. Tom Frazier, Program Director, Josh Stearns, and, and Paul Waters, who I think is here. And then we also have a lot of awesome women. But I um, did, did want to say they, they um, think all this is important, too, but it is great to be on a panel of all women. That's always nice. Um, so um, hi for everyone that doesn't know me. I'm Teresa Gorman. Um, uh, I'm the local news associate at Democracy Fund, so we pretty think uh, local news is pretty important. Um, I come out of working in mostly public radio. 
um, it, it, working at NPR, working with member stations, just figuring out um, how to do all of these new things that are coming around, um, and on projects like local lore and experimenting with community engagement. So local <coughs> has been important for me for my entire career. Um, so I think that's um, kind of where I come from um, and what I bring into my work. Um, for those that don't know, Democracy Fund is a bipartisan foundation based in Washington, D.C., funded by uh, Piero Vidiar, who founded eBay. Um, so the, the big goal is putting people first in our democracy. Um, and we do that in a few different ways. Uh, one is, uh, we have three different programs. One is effective governance. Uh, one is making elections uh, more accessible and uh, relevant to, the, to today. And then our final public square is where we are thinking about journalism. And uh, Jan, you, you mentioned all of the kind of different things that have been the trends. Um, and we actually, cover a lot of those in our program. So we have a few buckets of uh, focus, uh, engaged journalism, which um, Paul Waters, who's here, is the lead on that program. So um, you should talk to him and meet him in the halls. Um, we also focus on some new focus areas around press freedom and misinformation and trust. Um, and investigative journalism, and then uh, the program I work on called Ecosystem News, which is our work on local news. So with that, we think that um, the future of local news is uh, an ecosystem. It's a little bit of everything that Jan talked about. So it, there's not gonna be one big anchor institution that does all the work. It's gonna be all of you and the tech tools and the engagement and uh, the public radio and the for profit and non profits. Everybody has to work together uh, to make local news thrive. So that's what we work on um, at Democracy Fund. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me. I'm Molly Day Aguiar. I'm the managing director for something called the News Integrity Initiative at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. If you were uh, here earlier for the Facebook presentation, they mentioned it briefly. Facebook is one of our partners. Um, the News Integrity Initiative is a little different. It's not a private foundation, and it's a it's a project. It's a philanthropic project. So um, it's currently a, a four year project, and what we're doing is investigating the the roots of mistrust in the news, and um, and investing in solutions for building uh, support for building public support for quality news. So it sort of boils, I, that's a very sort of big statement, sort of vague. So it sort of boils down to three main areas that we are interested in, which are um, community engagement, much like the Engaged Journalism Program, the Democracy Fund, we sort of go hand in hand with that. Um, how do we help build relationships between newsrooms and the public toward mutual trust and respect and understanding and, and hopefully long, full long-term sustainability for local news? Um, we want to do some work around uh, respectful and inclusive civic dialogue. And then we are also doing a little bit of work around mitigating the harm of misinformation and disinformation. Um, the other thing I want to say is that I, my, my background actually, before I came to the News Integrity Initiative, I worked for the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation in New Jersey, which is a place-based foundation that I was there for um, almost 12 years. So, my background is mostly in philanthropy. I do have a degree in journalism. If there are any other um, Wisconsin Badgers in the room, hey. <laughs> yay, Wisconsin. Um, so, um, you know, I've done a lot of work around um, local news in New Jersey, and um, and I see a few friendly faces out there who, are, who have been partners with me in that work. And um, I think a lot of what I might want to talk about today is actually wearing the Dodge hat because um, you know, that although the News Integrity Initiative is doing, believes that the opportunity is really at the local level, the Dodge work I think is a little bit more relevant to what you guys will be interested in today. So I'm going to kind of wear both hats today. <coughs> Hello, my name is Karen Rundlett, and I work for the Main Foundation. I'm a program officer. Uh, until two years ago, I was a journalist, and um, I only worked in local markets. I worked in Miami, and I worked in Atlanta, and I worked in West Palm Beach, and um, I worked in television news as a producer for a while, and I worked at the London Herald for 10 years. Um, we had also a public radio 
partnership at the Miami Herald that I was deeply involved in. Um, our focus areas, I would say, um, definitely local, obviously, also audience engagement and trust. And we have a, a bucket that we call talent and learning. And talent and learning is really training. And we believe that line publishers provide an excellent forum for training, and it comes from you. And one of our beliefs is that if we get people together who feel that they're alone and they find each other, they'll solve problems together. And line publishers is exactly an example of that. So I want to start with some nitty gritty questions that I hear from all of you, and I also want to take time for you guys to ask questions as well. So I, I hear all the time, some of you are calling me, I want to do a brand new side as a startup. Um, two questions I'd like each of you to address. Will you find something that hasn't existed before? There's no proof of concept of it's something in someone's mind. And will you find someone who is not a Bible one? can't hear you. I'll answer you if I use the mic. Good. Uh, uh, will you fund something um, that is a pure startup, no proof of concept yet? Um, will you provide seed funding? And will you fund something that is not a 501c3? Sure. Um, I'll answer the first part. Um, yes, we will terms of that, uh, I think there are lots of examples of something not existing and then being funded to this. One thing at Democracy Fund is that we focus on is capacity building. So we don't um, really focus on funding content. So if someone was to come and say, um, I want to start a local news organization that is going to cover X, Y, Z, that's not something that necessarily would fit within um, what we're trying to do. So cause we want to for local news um, across the entire country. So that's why with Lion, we're able to very create a program that can serve a lot of organizations. So um, that's kind of how it sounds like that uh, conversation would go. And then if you're not a 501c3, it's pretty tough uh, for us to to fund you. Um, there's you know some on not in a, uh, a CPA or another. Uh, lawyer, but I'm sure that there are ways to kind of figure out that. But with us, we are really focused on uh, nonprofit work. But what we can do is uh, find organizations that serve for profits, like Lion, um, as long as they really need our charitable purposes, like education. Um, yeah, so I think part of the answer to the startup question is what exactly you mean by startup? I mean, are you talking about an organization or like a whole new project, for example? So. Um, yes to a project, um, and maybe a little bit more wary on starting a whole new organization. Um, but one of the ways that we actually have supported that in the past, and I'm already realizing, even though I'm at the New Integrity Initiative, I was saying we as a, a Dodge, so bear with me. Um, we Dodge gave. Um, basically passed through money. We gave money to Montclair State's uh, Center for Cooperative Media to help um, seed some new sites, some new hyperlocals in New Jersey. But I think the part, what's so hard about that is it just it's a, it requires a lot of money. And to do it right, you really have to commit to it for probably at least a couple of years, probably longer. So I mean, I think that's what makes funding the startups really hard. Um, I guess you don't necessarily have to fund them in full, but still. And then um, in terms of funding for profit, for sure, definitely. Dodge um, had a, a partnership with the Knight Foundation where we worked with uh, five or six hyperlocals that were all for profit. That's what dominates the New Jersey landscape. And, um, and you know, private foundations are able to fund for profit entities that are aligned with the foundation's mission. So. Um, Dodge had no qualms about making um, grants. We didn't make huge grants. We gave experimental grants to help launch new revenue streams for those sites. But um, there, there was no resistance on on Dodge's front to do that. Yeah. 
So I would say, you referenced before, the pendulum swings back and forth. I think that we're advancing the story. So there was a time, perhaps in 2005, that all these ideas were new. And I'm sitting in a room full of publishers who have been at it for years. There are people who have been at this since 2008. There are people who have been at this for two years. So it varies. So I think that um, we have a lot of models out there already. And I think we're more in that space. I think that they're, um, what we're very concerned about now is we see people who are executing, so execution is very important, but what we're very concerned about now is continuation. How will you be able to do this for the long term? Which is very much in line with the discussions that I'm hearing at line publishers. So we're hearing, I mean, your point about multi-year funding is true. I know the Ethics and Excellence of Journalism Foundation just recently said, whoops, We've already committed 75% of our funding to multi-year projects, and we don't have anything left to give every year. So we're going to have to pull back on that. Um, where, um, if you were, are there any calls for proposals that you're going to be issuing, or that you know of deadlines upcoming that uh, members of LIME might qualify for? And maybe if they're not for you, if they're for a fund, or a project that is re-granting. Um, well, the, the Lion Project seems like a, a thing that people should definitely get involved in. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, I'm working on a fund that is not yet finalized. <laughs> um, but, but for, I mean, I think the, tar the targets are for nonprofit newsrooms, but um, to to help uh, subsidize the cost of some community engagement tools that are out there. So that will hopefully get finalized and announced <coughs> relatively soon. So I would say that um, if any of you follow my foundation on Twitter, we often announce open calls and challenges. So when you see those words, that is when we've decided to do something that is open to anyone. And that's where for-profits can apply. And we did one this year. It was around improving the flow um, of accurate information to communities. We also worked with Lenfest. They did a challenge this year. So when you see that, and the, and the prizes were, um, the prize money was um, a lower amount, which I don't want to quote right now because I'm sitting in a room full of journalists, but um, it, was around, it was around 30. And then the higher for the more advanced ideas was a six figure, it was a six figure amount. I, I believe it was around 100. So that, that's an example. I will also say too, um, we um, funded a challenge with the National Association of Broadcasters. There probably aren't very many broadcasters in the room. And they, they did uh, two, we funded two challenges. They just closed the entries for one. There will be another one next year. The question was, what unconventional ways might broadcasters or other media uh, uh, pursue to support local communities? Uh, many universities entered. Um, many nonprofits entered. These are these are avenues. The prizes were about thirty five thousand, twenty five thousand. Anytime you see challenge or open call and anything on our, our Twitter feed or any of our messaging, that's an opportunity for you. So basically, what I hear you saying is there's not much out there for operating support for um, for online folks. I don't know that I would necessarily agree with that overall thing. That, I mean, one of the things yeah. that's different um, about democracy fund is that we don't generally do open calls. Um, so a lot of it is about just building a relationship and getting to know us. And um, you know, we fund mostly nonprofits, but what we also do is we kind of serve as a connector. Um, so if we know what you're working on, um, we have kind of a broader overview of the field because it's our job, and I know you and you can't spend the time paying attention to what everybody else is doing. Um, so that's one thing that we can provide. It, so if there are places to provide general operating support. Um, and I think one thing to know in terms of that is how important general operating support is. Um, I think we, we know that and we realize that that's the best practice in the community. So um, that is something, you know, as making healthy organizations thrive, that's something to always keep in mind. Um, I think it's a lot harder to make a case for operating support for a for-profit 
um, as opposed to helping launch a revenue stream, like, for example. Um, I totally agree with Teresa that operating support for our nonprofits is best practice. It's what we, what foundations should be doing. Um, Dodge gives almost exclusively um, operating support, and I was always very proud of that. Um, uh, the News Integrity Initiative, like I said, it's different. It's um, because because it's a limited time frame. We're more focused on on projects and ideas and tools as opposed to operating support. You said something really smart before that you should repeat about getting to know someone. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I always encourage newsrooms, whether for profit or nonprofit, to get to know um, your community foundation and start to educate community foundations about what you do, how um, mission oriented and community minded you are. Um, it's sort of, we, we all play a role, I think funders play a role in helping other funders understand how important it is, how, how funding um, news and information in a community is, a, is an investment in the whole community. And, um, and you know, we should, um, we should all work together to, <laughs> to help convince other funders to join this space, whether it's you know for, for a nonprofit newsroom, which a lot of community foundations don't have access. I mean, in all of New Jersey, I think there's only one nonprofit <laughs> newsroom, so it may be for community foundations there isn't a nonprofit newsroom around. So, um, but there are there are mission-oriented newsrooms in their areas. So I used to excel at the community foundation part of that. So what I would say there as well, so that's that's a do, that's a get that done right away. If you haven't met your community foundation, if you haven't met your community foundation, go in and introduce yourself and tell them what you do. And I, I would also say that, as we all know, this is a moment for journalism. We talked about that yesterday. People are understanding the value of journalism. Maybe they took it for granted for a while. Not now. This moment will not last forever. You have to find partners there. What I can say, something that you might not know because it wouldn't necessarily be in the world, is Knight is constantly creating relationships and having conversations with community foundations and saying, what can you do to help support the local information, the needs of local information for residents in local communities? So that's a big conversation. We're always engaging with community foundations. We support 26 communities and we know the community foundations in every single one of them. And we have a big convening where we talk to them about what's going on in journalism and how they might be able to support journalism in local communities. That's a question, please. Um, I, did, I tried to reach out to our community foundation and they said we only work with nonprofits. And, and then when I reached out to my community foundation in Nashville, they said we only work with nonprofits and like that was the end of the conversation. I didn't even get a chance to say, but journalism is important, and would you please just meet with me? I got completely shut down. I, I'm just, I'm like, I guess I'm asking, like, is that something you could help me with? Like, that, or if that's their policy, that's their policy. So. Well, what if you approach them through Lion or, or INN, or Francisco Asia? Yeah, that's why I'm not going to know what's a good idea to go back and do that. How do you feel about this? I'm, I'm not giving up. <laughs> Totally comfortable with fiscal agents. I think that's a great creative workaround. Karen? We work with fiscal agents as well. I think that um, the other thing you have to think about too is who your nonprofit partners may be. Maybe there is an opportunity for you to work with a public radio station. That may be a way to get support for your work. There are opportunities like that as well. Yeah, baby steps. What? Baby steps. <laughs> it'll take time to build that relationship, and hopefully, uh, eventually, it'll come around to, to even being able to have a conversation. So, what is that home run project for you? You know, everybody promises you all these deliverables. Um, you give them grant. Sometimes they deliver, sometimes not. Um, um, what kind of evidence that you made a good grant do you look for? And, and give us all an example of what you consider a home run project. That's a good one. Um, so I think in terms of um, impact, uh, we call ourselves a learning organization. So um, we you know, have metrics, we have things that we ask 
you know, people to tell us what the project is going to do. But uh, if at the end of the day um, you're just checking things off of a list, then that's not useful, um, and the field isn't learning. So I think a, the kind of broad answer is um, if you've learned and applied that learning to the field. Um, and uh, another one um, that I'm really thinking a lot about in local news right now is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's um, really, really top of the list um, for us right now. If your organization um, with a project that you're working on, and it, it, um, it doesn't have to be a DEI project, um, and, and in fact it shouldn't be, but if at the end of uh, your project, we're, we're kind of moving that into every single grant and every single project we're doing. Um, your staff, your stories, your sources, um, in whatever type of work you're doing, um, haven't become more diverse um, and inclusive, then that's not a home run. So if they have, that'll be a home run for us. Um, especially with local news, that's really important. There's so many um, communities that just have never been covered, um, so that's something that we're really thinking about right now. Anything that you funded uh, today that you're really particularly proud of? So, uh, one uh, project that I'm really excited about is the News Revenue Hub. Um, so, this organization is working with uh, news organizations, a mix of for profits and non profits. <laughs> Um, to set up member service programs, um, and they working. I won't. I won't say the numbers because I know that they change. But I know Mary Walter Brown is here who runs that organization, um, and they've helped organizations raise um, in, in total, if you combine the five to seven publishers, uh, millions of dollars through uh, that membership program. Good. Uh, I couldn't agree more about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's really important that journalism reflects the communities that it's trying to serve. Um, so, 100% to all of that. Um, so, what I would look for in a proposal, I, I, um, I am looking for signals that the that the proposal is very clear, but also very sort of honest about what's feasible to accomplish. And like Teresa, I think it's not, it, it's not, this work is ongoing, right? It's, and, it, and it evolves over time. So it's not like, you know, there's going to be one project and, you know, it just fits inside this box and when it's done, it's done. Like it doesn't, it's, it's a lot more, it, it's not so black and white. So. Um, you know, learning, adapting along the way, being honest about what's working, what's not working. And funders have to step up and, and be very clear in the signals that we send that we're not going to punish you um, for mistakes that you make. So I think that part is very important too. We always have to be very, very mindful of the power dynamics at play. Um, I care a lot about, um, about, uh, just some really honest language about, um, you know, being clear about what your mission is and what the goal is of, of a project or, or whatever the proposal is, and then being willing to speak really honestly and directly as to, you know, how, how you're going to accomplish that and, and when it's over or when you're coming back for renewal, um, speak very directly to what it is you said you were going to do. Um, it's, you know, I just sort of appreciate, um, Dick Topol at ProPublica has written a lot about impact and how you, know, you have to be very clear in your mission from the beginning and, and be rigorous in the way that you measure yourself against that mission. And I just sort of appreciate that clearly um, in the language that people use. That said, I will say that at Dodge, we, we read a lot of proposals that weren't great proposals, but we still sort of went out and met with people. And you know, not everybody's a great proposal writer, and so we we were pretty um, flexible about that and learned a lot more by going out and talking to people and trying to understand the proposal better. Um, can I say two two things? Uh, two uh, grants that I am particularly proud of in New Jersey. One is um, the Center for Cooperative Media. See you out there, Cindy. <laughs> so when we launched our, and <laughs> see you back there too. 
Um, when we launched the Informed Communities Program at Dodge seven or eight years ago, uh, they were the first thing that we actually did um, because we felt that the entire infrastructure of the local news ecosystem in New Jersey needed attention. And how could we create a more connected and collaborative news ecosystem in New Jersey? And the way we did that was by establishing um, the Center for Cooperative Media along with our partners at night. And they were, they're sort of like the lion, in some respects, they're sort of like the lion for the state of New Jersey. They provide all kinds of services and support and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And, um, and that whole um, approach to supporting the infrastructure, I think, has wildly exceeded our expectations for, um, for the strength of the ecosystem in New Jersey. So we are particularly proud of that, and Dodge continues to fund them, as does Democracy Fund, um, and Knight, too, I think. So um, that is really good work. The other one that I would mention is um, we funded the Center for Investigative Reporting to come in and do a large-scale collaborative investigative reporting project, which really actually builds upon the, the work that we established with the Center for Cooperative Media, because what we were trying to do, we didn't care about what the investigation was about. It was about the collaboration itself and also um, the way, the creative ways in which um, CIR has really pioneered um, storytelling techniques through theater, a lot of the art space, through theater and um, art exhibits and things like that. So they did a project called Dirty Little Secrets, which focused on um, New Jersey's sort of toxic legacy. And uh, that this year they are doing uh, another project around called Voting Block around the New Jersey's all of New Jersey's elections are are coming up uh, in a couple of weeks I guess. Um, but what was incredibly powerful about that grant for us as a funder was CIR came in and not only helped connect all of the uh, newsrooms that they worked with in New Jersey, they, they also reached out to all kinds of nonprofits um, in New Jersey and other community anchors. And for us alone, they, they worked with 18 different Dodge grantees. So they're helping to build our network in New Jersey, which is amazing, because that's what we're trying to do all the time as funders. We're trying to connect the dots between organizations that are doing complementary work in places across the state. So that, that was an absolute home run. Plus, it's helping newsrooms think differently about the way they engage with their communities. Great example. Great. Karen. So I um, can point to a few grants that um, I'm proud of. Some of them are new. Um, I'm just going to mention uh, two. Um, one is um, an organization called Unlock. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. And um, grants solve problems, and we fund grant work that solves problems for the field of journalism. So they made FOIA affordable, they made it accessible through digital, and they were doing the work for, I believe it was seven years before they got funding from us. And they had funding from other uh, sources. They were very lean. Um, he worked a full-time job. The funding that we provided and others have provided allowed him to go full-time to this work, but it was seven years. So it was seven years of doing this work. And it solved the problem. It made FOIA, I mean, citizens use this. I, it's, it's not just for journalists. Um, so it, it, I think that's a good project, and it's about his work to grow Muck Rock, but also to get the word out about Muck Rock. So that's at the beginning stages, so we'll see how that goes, but I, I think that was somebody who did great work. Um, obviously, I can also point to Newsmatch, um, some of the nonprofits here. Um, the thing is that basically when you do talk to a room full of publishers, everybody would like direct funding to do what they want to do. <laughs> I understand that. I would like direct funding to do what I want to do. Um, but um, um, but um, that doesn't always happen. So the, the brilliance, I think, of Newsmatch um, is that um, you do receive direct funding, but in the process, you receive training. So I think that there's getting fish and there's learning how to fish. And I think Newsmatch for the nonprofit newsrooms who receive it get to do both. So I think that is exceptional. And we had funding partners this year, um, of course. And um, 
Democracy Fund and MacArthur, and it's now $3 million. Kathy is, is back there as well, and uh, Paul. And uh, so I would, I would point to those two. And I, I also want to mention that um, David Beer is here, and he works on another project, which you can hear about later. And it is called the Single Topic Websites. And it's about folks who are just covering one single beat, like climate change. And again, we don't fund content, but we wanted to fund work around an audience engagement for this new way of doing journalism. I'm going to ask you one quick question and open it up to the folks in the end. Um, so, Andy Hall told me last night he's been working on getting some grants for six or seven years. Um, at some point, I know as a supplicant, you think, oh God, they already told me no, so should I run away and not bother them again? Or should I keep asking? And at what point do you have um, grant? prospects come after you and you're like, I'm going to run to the bathroom so I don't have to talk to this person again. <laughs> or do you want people to uh, keep coming at you? Uh, yes, I guess. Yes, keep coming at, at me. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's my job to be listening and learning and talking to people. Um, I do realize that sometimes things <laughs> take years to build relationships. So it's all about, you know, keeping us in the loop. Just, I... We want to know what you're working on and keep talking to us. Things don't always work out um, right away. It might take forever, um, but it's just good to stay uh, connected. And yes, keep coming. Don't run away. Um, I agree with that mostly. Uh, I will say in my new role, I've had some incredibly persistent people who do make me want to hide in the bathroom. It's, it's very aggravating even to say, not, not right now, like, can you give me some time? And they're, and they're still persistent. Like, there is, you can definitely cross a line where um, it's just too much and you, you end up wanting to avoid that person because they haven't sort of figured out that they're being a little too persistent. Um, that said, the, the, that's you know relatively rare, and I agree. I mean, it, it takes a, a long time to build those relationships. The other thing that um, it's sort of hard to describe, but it, it just kind of is the way it is. Is that um, is that sometimes it's just not the right time for a number of different reasons. There are a lot of different factors, and, and they feel like they they're sort of always moving. There's a lot of different moving factors about um, that go into the decision making. Like you mentioned earlier, ethics and excellence in journalism and their budget. Budget is always an issue. Um, you know, have you already committed to something? Have you already committed to something similar to what this person is proposing to you? Um, are, do you have the right partners in place at the right time? There's just like there are so many different things that sort of are all shifting, and so sometimes. Um, the answer might be no, not right now, but it might be yes in six months, or it might be yes in a year, and it's just, um, it's, it is a good idea to keep those relationships up um, and keep people informed of, of what you're working on, but, but also be mindful of not being so persistent that we want to just avoid <laughs> talking to you. So again, if I were sitting in the audience, and I hope I'm right about this, and if I'm wrong, you can raise, I would want to know what to do. So I will say, um, please know that I am always listening. I'm also supposed to be always listening. Um, it is not necessarily always about coming up to me and saying, I have this great idea. It's good to speak up. So I heard 40 ideas in 40 minutes. Trust me, I jotted them down. I, we're looking for ideas. So I would say, be in a network. You're here, so you're in a network. Speak up at meetings. Run a panel. Panelists are remembered. Host a panel. I would say make yourself visible about your ideas. And, and also, too, don't just share good news. Share struggles. Because philanthropy solves problems. That's the goal, anyway. And, and we're better, and I got this from Molly, so we're better at solving the long-term problems because we have the money to do so. So as much as we do try to be urgent, we also try to be thoughtful. And so I would say, write about things. I would, I, I would say that too. Be a leader in an organization. Be vocal and visible about the problems and the challenges, because I think that also, we're also listening to that as well. So it's not necessarily, you know, you can hear someone speak sometime and, sometimes and they 
really identifies something so critical that you miss, and it's, it's, it's gold, and you take that back to your organization. So I would say that to be a leader and a voice for your field, so, so that it, we can help grow the industry and strengthen the industry. Oh, Jay, can I add to yes, that? please. That point about communicating your work is so important. It cannot be overstated. I'm so glad you said that because um, you got, you know, the field isn't, even though sometimes it may seem like it, it's not documenting its work enough. And it's it's a gold mine for, for those of us who are trying to, you know, we're always trying to gather information and learn about new things. and. And you know, being able to read about a project that you've worked on or whatever it is, like just document your work more and the lessons learned more, and that will also help make the case. And I, I please do read the website and read the strategy because we do have a mission. And um, if you're confused about the language, that's okay. I understand that. If you're if you want some more specificity, but sometimes I get emails that. We just would never fund that, and it says so on the website. So I, I would just also say that. I mean, if you do have questions now or here, please ask them. We're not perfect. This is a human. This is a human enterprise. Philanthropy. I, I said this before too. Philanthropy very much is a mystery. We hope to demystify it for you. So we've got time for just a few questions. questions it looks yes. Looks like Rose has her hand up over here. Okay, I'm going to take one to the team here. So, um, you know, you, all of you said it's no your foundation folks and whatnot, and I totally get that. It, it's it's so frustrating though, because sometimes you spend time building a relationship, and then the program officer leaves, and you're like. Oh, can I swear? Yes, please. Oh, for fuck's sake, you know? I was like, I'm just ready to make the ass really like, you know, and then it's just like, you know, the, the opportunity is just gone, and you have to start back over from zero. Like, how, how can, you know, how can we get around that? Like, that's just, that's sort of one thing. The other thing, you know, you're talking about documenting your, documenting your impact, like, part of, you know, for us, right, we're just so busy doing the work, right, and, you know, and, and it's, it's, for me, it's ironic, because I'm always saying to my, to folks in the public health world who are constantly looking for funding, like, hey, you know, you know, document your ROI, right, ROI is king, right, and, you know, what, what's my ROI? Well, you know, I've published 270 stories in the past year about stuff that no one else in our state is writing about. We're the only health reporters in the entire freaking state of 10 million people, right? So it's really like, I guess part of it is just like the documenting the work is like, well, we're here, you know? So I guess I'm just looking for some feedback on how can we keep the continuity when when you folks like to come, you go, and you know you're not always sticking around, right? So how do you how do you maintain that? Fair um, question. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. I, I um, the opposite happens with us as well. Um, as some organizations, but if I get a director, or the person we're talking to leaves, and you're like, oh, okay, well, never mind. Um, starting from scratch. So how? How I have done that in the opposite situation and how we actively are trying to do that is to always invite two people. Um, always, you know, don't have the one person. So if there are, I know often foundation, there is only one person, but ways to make sure that things are being shared. Um, so we always invite at least two people to meetings from organizations. We make sure um, to, you know, when it's appropriate, you don't want to kind of go over your program officer um, to, to above them. Um, but if it's appropriate to make sure that the assistance, everyone is kind of looped in, just constantly communicating. And then in terms of the documenting, I mean, I agree, but I also understand that, you know, you're, you're feeding the beast. So that's part of some of the capacity organizations that we support, like INN, ONA, uh, Lion, it, part of that is hoping that they can play part of that role by elevating your voice and knowing that you're doing that. And um, So that's one way that we're trying to support that because we know people don't have the time to, to do all that work. Um, and also 
Um, I'm constantly trying to do that for uh, the local fix email, which I, I write with Josh Stearns every week. Um, I, I don't think we sent it out yet. We might be sending it out right now while I'm sitting up here. Um, but that's one thing, too, that we realize it's really coming to hard to find those stories. So we're constantly trying to find the, the, the pointers and the CDRs and figure out you know, how um, to help connect those dots as well. Do you guys want to speak to that? Um, I mean, I think you covered it. I think that bringing two people is a great idea if you can if you can convince you know somebody at the foundation to do that. I mean, unfortunately, it's just life, right? I mean, people come and go, and I know it's super frustrating. You can ask some people in New Jersey how how they felt when they learned that I was living too. So, um, and you know, the one thing I want to clarify is when I when I talk about documenting your work, it doesn't have to be necessarily about your impact. Um, it's just like help us learn as you're learning. Um, one of the one of my favorite examples. I don't know if she's in the room. I saw Jen Brandell outside from Harkin. Like I think Harkin does a really great job of just sort of constantly talking about their work and what they're learning about, and um, and it's sort of baked into the model of Harkin itself too. It's like you know how are you transparent as reporters about about the stories that you're working on, what you're learning along the way. And I think that is every bit as important, if not more important, than trying to like come up with some big idea of how you have created impact. You know, it's like it's it's smaller than that. Bite off smaller pieces. Um. My name is Jay, I'm with Richland Source, and I was on a panel with Jan last year at Lion, and we were talking about impact and how um, foundations measure impact. And um, I mentioned to the, the crowd that we had just embarked on this project where we were going to tackle infant mortality in our county. And, and through the Solutions Journalism Network, we got a modest grant, which we tried to turn into something that made, that made an impact. And we were really relentless about trying to measure everything that we could measure. And, you know, and we thought about how do we do it, and we, we thought about um, the event that we were going to hold. How are we going to know that the moms that came through the event actually engaged with the educational resources that were there? And um, my question is, we were sort of like a canary in a coal mine. I mean, we'd never applied for a grant before. We just sort of went at it with our whole hearts and our whole minds to try to do well with it. But what do you look for when you're measuring impact? So, I mean, you made a great point about, I wrote 275 stories. Is that impact? I, I like, for us, I want to go after a $100,000 grant next. You know, I mean, I want to take on a gigantic project and, and have multiple newsrooms involved. And I want the found, what, whoever funds it, I want them to feel like they have the best possible partner and they feel unbelievably confident that we're going to get it done. But I think that you're going to need to know that we got it done. And it would be really helpful is for I think everybody here if we're swinging to you know swinging for the fences to try to really make an impact in our communities or in the coverage verticals that we have to know that this is what we're really looking for. And I appreciate the idea of keeping us informed and the small things and those sorts of stuff, but I just come, I come from this from the point of view of a, of a business person. My clients want a return, right? And you guys, at that point in time, you become my client. You know, I have to, you, you, we've exchanged value for money. And at that point in time, my job is to deliver a return to you and to understand how you're going to measure that, I think would be enormously helpful to everyone in this room so that we could, so we can do, we can work really hard to deliver that return so it becomes a confident investment. It's a thing that you do because you know you're going to get it. It's not a sympathy give. You know, I don't want sympathy money. I want people who fund our projects to know that our team is going to Bend, up, bend over backwards to make it work and you know to be able to deliver real concrete results. So any comment that you can make for the audience on that I think would be really helpful. <coughs> that. So I'll just work with the example of Newsmatch again that um, I spoke about before. I, I, this, it, I don't know if this is exactly the answer. I mean our idea of impact 
Knight Foundation is looking at impact for the field. You know, in, in, Knight, in Newsmatch, we supported 57 organizations and we said you can do a match up to $25,000. Everybody did not make it. Not making it, and that's a specific run. I don't know if that's exactly what you're talking about. I, I feel like we almost need to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But, um, because this is, again, very human, and every foundation is different in its aspirations and its intentions. So uh, every, every organization that did not make it, we learned something from. That's, again, why I say please be honest about your struggles. Maybe they realized that they needed to hire someone. Maybe they realized they needed a tool. Maybe they realized they weren't saving enough email addresses, storing them correctly. Maybe they realized they should have uh, you know, worked on uh, direct mail more. It's, 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 it's all, so that's the way we're measuring impact. In terms of for your organization and knocking it out of the park, I think it is you should take foundations to task who are asking you to be funded and say specifically, what are you looking at? I think in terms of journalism and impact on the community, I'll use an example. We funded Macon, Macon is in, Macon, Georgia. Macon, Georgia is in my community. So we fund there. Um, something called the Center for Collaborative Journalism. And um, they have multiple partners. Impact, for, impact in that community um, because we're concerned about the information needs of residents in Macon, they did a project around what they called the light in the community. That is a community with almost an even breakdown of African American and white residents. And um, there were socioeconomic tensions around this, this, this conversation. They met with hundreds of residents. They did a lot of community engagement and they did the work, and the work led to a $14 million bond initiative that the residents thought of to bring up and raise. That's impact. Okay, but really, we're measuring what did it do for the field. So we're looking at, was it a new method or model? You know, the return to community engagement. Is that a helpful answer? Yeah, absolutely. I think you really have to push foundations, look, just, Please be as straight with me as possible. I'm going to get great at the end of this. So what, what do I need to do well? Yeah, I want an A. <laughs> but you, but ultimately, but ultimately, you also want an A for your community that you're serving. Absolutely. I mean, the, but that, and that's the idea is the result of this to serve the community and the, the foundation. If we're on the same page and we're aligned on what the goal is, then we can all work together to get to the end. Maybe the end is just figuring out what you don't know. That's fine. If that's the end, more, that's great. But if it's like the end of the day, that, that's also a little bit Can I jump in just real quickly? I did Solutions Journalism Network, and you did hit it out of the park. We were thrilled with everything you did, and just the, the uh, audience engagement, coming back to us all the time and telling us everything. It's a model that we will uh, happily fund with others when we have the opportunity. I think we've got time for. One more quick question. Did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I did, okay. I did actually. Um, I think that the conversation around metrics and impact is really difficult because every foundation has a different idea of what that means. And it's incredibly aggravating to you guys. And I, I don't blame you for, for feeling that way at all. Um, I think the, the three of us on the panel are interested in the learning as opposed to like quantitative metrics, which are for the most part fairly meaningless. Um, depends. There are some exceptions to that. But, but you know, this is sort of what I was talking about earlier with um, being honest with what it is you think is reasonable to accomplish and then being rigorous about whether or not you met your goals. I don't want to set your goals for you. Funders don't want to do that. That's too heavy handed. Um, you have to come to us and say, this is what we want to get done. And, you know, and then being honest about along the way about whether or not you're you're, you're making progress toward those goals. Um, but also, if you don't meet those goals, there's lots of valuable stuff that comes out of that, as these guys have said. So um, it's um, and different projects and different proposals have different goals, you know, for, for funders have different goals. Like if I'm going back to the CIR grant, 
um, what I really wanted to see was not <clears throat> how many, not necessarily how many different um, newsrooms they could get to collaborate, although that, that was interesting to me. Um, I wanted to see if they could influence the way the other newsrooms were thinking about, um, about community engagement. And could they, could they expand the horizons of other newsrooms about different ways of storytelling? And they were very successful on that front. And as a bonus, they also stitched together this incredible network of Dodge grantees that I never expected them to really do in the way that they did. So we learned a lot along the way that I could not have predicted in the beginning. But it's, it's a really difficult question to answer because you're going to get different answers from different funders. But that's a legitimate answer. The answer is you need to communicate with the individual funder about but have a dialogue about what the project's goals are and get aligned on that. That's fine too. If that's the best way to do it, that works great. Actually, I would prefer that. All right, last question. Last question. Here. No problem. Uh, my name is Shaquanda Johnson. I'm from Flint, Michigan. And I have a site called FlintBeat.com. And now I am developing or launching a nonprofit called Brown and And one of my questions, I have two quick questions. One is Brown and Pike Media Group is in the process of developing a news literacy program in the Flint area because what I found after I launched FlintBeat.com is I didn't have writers. Because people there, the youth, they're not engaged. They don't have any journalism programs, high school level nor universities. And so I'm in the process of doing that. Also, just recently, I developed a printed voter's guide because we're in the middle of a messy recall in the Flint area. There are some questions with the senior population about their recall, absentee ballots, and whatnot. 30% of that community, they do not do internet. And so one of the questions is, are those the type of projects that your organizations would be interested in funding? And also, my second question is, what I found is I need help with business operations. Like when I stepped out here, I'm a journalist, and I didn't think about the multiple hats that you have to wear when you're launching a publication, or even now with developing this nonprofit. So is there funding out there for that, too? Um, I'd say, so the, the, your questions are kind of, I'll, totally connected. So in terms of Democracy Fund, what we would be more likely to support would be the second part, so the business operations um, uh, kind of cohort type work, training. We do lots of capacity building. And there's lots of different programs out there that um, are doing that, including you know within Lion. There's people here that have been thinking about that. Um, so I won't list all the different programs, but there's lots of things like that trying to answer that question, there's tons of journalists that go into um, starting their local news organizations but don't know how to run a business and don't know how to make money. So how can we help uh, journalists become business people and business people become journalists? Um, so there's programs like that. And it might be your community foundation um, that would help you with the literacy part. Um, you know, that would be interesting. Yeah, um, so yeah, I want to tackle the second the second question there too. I mean, I think there's a tremendous role for philanthropy to play to provide that capacity building support. I think that's a, a really great sweet, I mean, that's like a sweet spot for philanthropy. Um, one of the one of the things that we always talked about with the with the hyper locals that, that we helped fund and, and others um, that was a, a nugget of wisdom from Lisa Williams, who used to be at INN. Um, she's she advises sites to think about how can you take foundation funding and turn it into a permanent revenue stream so that um, that revenue stream replaces the foundation funding so that you're not relying on that. So can you take a grant from, from a foundation and turn it into an events business, for example, or something else? And I just think that mindset you know, obviously much easier to say that than to actually do it, but the mindset of that I think is really, really important and it also, um, you know, sort of helps guard against uh, an over-reliance on foundation funding and if that goes away because we are, there are, there are those of us who are fickle, I don't think we are, we are those, um, you know, then, then it's sort of not a cat catastrophic situation for you. 
So if, if you're if you're talking about baby boxes or talking about literacy projects, this is not dispassionate objective journalism. Um, and, and I think there are new breeds of journalism emerging in the entrepreneurial news space. Does that bother you? No, <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, so in terms of democracy fund, we, we're trying to come at it from the citizen or the people. So what are the news and information needs of people? And they get the news and information from lots of different sources. So um, really thinking from that avenue. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that that will, will come across. Um, and this is this could probably be, that question could probably be a whole another uh, hour or session or day. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, I, I, I do think um, the points that you raised and um, something similar in a way happened in Macon. Um, they tried a, a, a specific tool to reach audience and the, the tool that ended up working, the tools, the two tools, a, a specific kind of new social media platform, bells, whistles, all of it, and in Macon around the light project what, what worked with email and phone calls. So I, I understand what you're saying about for certain communities the, the tactile paper is still very valuable. I think that's real. Um, I um, also want to say that um, sort of the questions that you're raising internally at the foundation, at, you know, the things that we're doing and the things that we're debating. So I, I want you to know that the conversation is going on about how to inform community and how to push to the future of journalism. And there's a disconnect. And there's ro all I can say is that there's robust discussion about it and and what will come, I, I can't just say yet, but I, I hear you on that, and um, I'm hoping that there will be opportunities in, in the future to address really getting a community. We've gone uh, quite a bit over time, and it's uh, time to eat lunch. And I, I want to say not only thank you for the, the four of you for being here today and sharing your thoughts, but thank you so much for your support and all the advice. That Thank you.